Okay, I want to go um, start going through the um, grammar book now. And these videos I'm going to make are going to be designed around making it easier to get through the grammar book. Um, you can go ahead and finish the grammar book on your own without these videos if you want to. If you find grammar is relatively easy for you and you just want to work through the book, that's fine. Um, these videos are entirely designed around making things a little bit easier if you're running into any challenges with this. So each one's going to be about 20 minutes and I'll make about two to three for every chapter. Okay, so let me jump into this one. Um, the first chapter is, um, for most folks, by far the easiest. It is the easiest one to complete, but it lays the foundation for everything that comes later on. It lays the foundation for it. And my approach in this is a little bit different than what you may have learned in other classes. And let me jump into that <clears throat> with, um, this is, you know, I, I call it organizing a mess, trying to make sense out of this language. Um, because as most of you have probably noticed, the English language is a mess. And a lot of the things you've been told in junior high and high school and throughout your life about grammar is it, there's always exceptions to every rule. There's contradictions. It doesn't seem to make sense. If anybody can make sense out of the spelling rules, um, well, nobody can. So, and I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a reason of what we're doing here and why we're doing it and why we're going through grammar one more time. It is not about learning where the commas go um, or anything like that. There's reasons for it, and I'll go through this here. Now, so the primary reason <clears throat> I'm showing you this, I'm going through this, is the use of grammar should not be about getting things right. Okay, I want to make that very clear. And in fact, you should. Um, never go go through grammar with the idea that there's a correct way and an incorrect way. Um, this book is what's called a rhetorical grammar and that we're going to just learn how to use it in order to develop our ideas and to operate better in what's called standard written English. That's the purpose of this book. Um, the idea of correct grammar is actually incorrect. Okay. Now, I mentioned in the book there's a um, something called a comprehensive grammar of the English language. And I want to show you that. Um, that's this book right here. And this is um, about si more than 1,600 pages. And this is a comprehensive one written back in 1980. Um, it could probably be about twice that length now. Um, I'm assuming you don't want to learn that. So this is a comprehensive grammar. Um, every grammar book that's ever been written outside of this one um, <clears throat> is a small selection of what's going on in those bigger books. Those bigger books, because of the nature of English and because of how goofy it is, um, those bigger books are the ones that encompass everything that we could know about it. But the fact is you guys don't want to know everything about it. You just probably, I'm assuming, just want to write your essays and come across as knowing what you're doing. Um, it's pretty simple. Okay, and you're you know tired of the red pens getting making a mess on your essays. That's more along the lines of what these books are trying to do. So these books are a small selection um, of what can be done in a comprehensive one. Now my book is a little bit closer to this one, Martha Combs. Um, it's called a rhetorical grammar. That's what mine's doing. It's so that you can make decisions rhetorical decisions about how you want to explain your ideas. And it's about using language to develop them and um, explain things more precisely and more accurately and ultimately with a little more grace and elegance. Um, <clears throat> because again, you're, you're going to see that um, knowing how to use this language isn't going to be about knowing where the commas go or finding just the right word. Those ideas about getting it correct or finding just the right word. Those ideas about grammar, which are the ideas that most people pick up from junior high and high school grammar um, instruction, those are wrong. In fact, those are creating many of the problems that you run into by the time you get to college. So the idea behind this um, book is not about correct or incorrect, because that whole notion is misguided. Um, instead, the idea of this book is so that you can develop your ideas a little more accurately. Okay, so that's where we're going, and I'll come to that idea as we go through this. Now, the first thing I want to point out about how the book works is both reflections. You get the first one on page 11, 
wherever you see a reflection, you write in any answer that you think is thoughtful. Um, why are you trying to improve your English grammar? <clears throat> And just give an honest answer, whether or not you, I will, you know, maybe you don't need much of it, but maybe you do, just so, you know, um, just give your reasons for it. <clears throat> um, when do you run into the most problems in grammar? And you give your own answers. And reflection exercise, and the reflections, um, you just answer the way you think is appropriate to you, okay? Um, as you go through the book, um, and this gets into the nature of this book and everything else, and these are the goals for the book, by the way, I'm going to mention this. Um, allows you to write sentences in acceptable standard written English, and I'll get to what this is and what it isn't in a bit, and gives you grammatical strategies for developing your sentences. That's a major thing. So to develop your ideas, notice that there is no real idea of what's correct and incorrect. I'm going to talk about what standard written English is and how to develop your ideas. And then the big thing is going to be to make you aware of the options you have when developing your ideas. Um, in your writing style. Notice that I don't talk about being right and wrong. That, <clears throat> that idea of right and wrong um, creates anxiety, and that's really what writer's block is about. What I want you aware of is your options when you're working within standard written English, because that's what we're writing here. Okay, okay let me go through some of these ideas. These are, and I should point out this, whenever you see an exercise, um, these are really drills in how to use the material that you just learned about. And just give your best answers. When I go through the books, I check the exercises and the reflections. I don't worry if you got all the exercises right. I want to see you trying to do your best at these. Some of these, and again, I, I do want to tell you I, I am still working on this textbook and trying to make it better. Some of these exercises are, are not well done. They need to be better. Just do your best with them. Uh, most of the exercises are in pretty good shape, <clears throat> but just do your best with them and show me a good faith effort throughout. Okay, um, And I'm going to be hopefully writing this book and rewriting it um, as we go on. Okay, Now here's a quick little history of English. This is why it's such a mess. Okay, This is why it's a mess. And it's English in this short little history um, tells you a little bit about it and why things got so goofed up and why it's so radically different. If some of you know Spanish or French or one of the other um, what are called Romance languages, you may be looking at English and going, what a mess. And you're right. Um, and it happened because of historical reasons. English comes from Germany. It's, um, it, it ultimately came about, it, it was really kind of, it developed out of German from around the years 500 AD to around 1066. 1066, I want to be very clear, is the one year I want you to have tattooed on the back of your forehead. It's the one year that changed everything in English. Up until that year, English looked and sounded a lot like German on the continent. English was developing in England, as many of you know, <clears throat> as basically a cousin of German, much the same way Italian and Spanish are related to each other and Portuguese is you know, a variation on Spanish, kind of, and they kind of make sense with each other. That's what Eng Old English was doing with German. Um, you can't understand Old English today. Here's a page of Old English. This is in the book. Y you can't read it. You might be able to understand one to three words every page. This is um, from The Wanderer. If you know anything about Beowulf, Beowulf was composed in Old English. If you read Beowulf, you read a translation. You did not read the original. Okay, it's a second language. If you learn Old English, you're learning it as a second language. Modern Germans could read about half these words. Modern English speakers can read about one to two, three words per page. Isn't that odd? Okay, this was when it was a lot closer to German. Okay, so um, and then 1066 happened. That's when a fellow by the name of he was known as William the Bastard at the time. He would become known as William the Conqueror. Um, and, and again, he got to England. He came from Norman France, Nor uh, Normandy in northern France. Um, and he came up and he took over England. Um, <clears throat> we have this tapestry, the Bayou Tapestry, demonstrating the history of it. And he brings French, Norman French, into English. That's what he does. And it's kind of a long story. But essentially what happened is that the royalty and the, the powers were using French while the common folks were using English, but there was an interaction between them. In fact, almost all of the words that English currently use 
uses for um, power and for government, in fact, government itself. But royal, president, parliament, ambassador, liaison, all of these are French words. The French became kind of overlapped under the English, and then it infil uh, infiltrated the English language because of William the Conqueror. This is a passage from um, the Wife of Bath, and you may have heard of the Canterbury Tales. And this is how it was originally spelled. You can read this. And when I saw he would never find to redden on this cursed book El Knight, I suddenly um, three leaves have I plight out of his book right as he read, and eke I with my fist took him on the cheek that in our fire he till backwards down. Um, he fell backwards down. You can get the idea that this guy was reading a book. Um, the wife of Bath, the narrator, got mad at him and tore three pages out of the book and punched him on the cheek. You can make sense out of this. And this is the English of Chaucer around 1380 or so, um, till around 1400. You can read this. He had a much more limited vocabulary than you do. Um, the vocabulary of English would develop and get a lot bigger. But the basic structure and the basic words within the language stabilized at this time. Now the big thing to understand is what you now have is English is this hybrid of German and French, two languages that are not directly related to each other. You have one which is called a Romance language of French, and the other is obviously a Germanic language. English was a Germanic language. This is like combining hockey and basketball together and finding out what happens. It's going to be a mess. This changed everything. It made English open to rapid change because there wasn't a stable rule system in place anymore. There were rules, but the rules, especially for vocabulary, went bonkers. And that's why we have all of these crazy words in English. Okay, so in about 40% of English today is, is French. English today is um, about eight times larger um, than modern day Spanish, even though Spanish is older. It's eight times larger because it allows words to come in. I, I always call it a come as you are party. It lets words come in like crazy. It has no way to block them. Okay. So now during the Renaissance, things were changing for England. English did stabilize by the Renaissance. This is the time of Shakespeare, Francis Bacon, Isaac Newton, and others. But what English became was a world power, and it was getting exposed to the rest of the world, and the rest of the world was paying attention to it. Again, this, this is William Shakespeare, Francis Bacon, Isaac Newton, Elizabeth I. Um, England is spreading out with its colonies, obviously coming to the Americas and other parts of the world. This is what's happening, though. What happens is the educated people of England know Greek and Latin, and if they're going to create new words, to explain this bigger world that they are now a part of, they started to use Greek and Latin to make those words. You can think of Greek and Latin as a junkyard that English speakers were using, and it was the educated English speakers. They were using that junkyard of Greek and Latin to make all these new words up, because the educated world throughout Europe spoke or wrote, spoke and wrote in Latin and Greek. In fact, this is. Uh, Philosophia Natura Principia Mathematica. Um, it's often called um, Principia Naturae. Um, <clears throat> this is um, Isaac Newton's book where he changed all the rules of physics and of the world um, for understanding how you know the how gravity and everything else works. He wrote it in Latin, not in English. Um, he wouldn't have thought of writing it in English. He wrote it in Latin because, of course, he knew Latin. But the rest of the world, the educated world, knew Latin at this time, at least in Europe. And so Latin and Greek were the languages of the educated people, and that's what educated people used to make new words. Almost all of our sophisticated vocabulary, including words like sophisticated, have Greek and Latin bases. And again, it was a junkyard where we reached in, grabbed parts, and put them together and made new English words. That's what happened. Now, that could happen in English because the French had already broken the system. You can't keep Latin and Greek words out because it's hockey basketball. You can't tell me no. You can't tell me I can't bring my skateboard when you got a hockey basketball going on right now. It's a come as you are party. So the language grew enormously during the Renaissance and Victorian times in the sophisticated vocabulary. And you're going to notice this in college, and many people think English is a Latin or Greek language. It's not. It imported enormous numbers of Latin Greek words during the Renaissance. Okay, 
because the educated people knew these words. Okay, let me go on now. The modern period is probably the least important, but it's the period we're in right now. And people can essentially create words and get them on the internet, and they're essentially words. Um, but these words aren't as important for what we're going to call um, standard written English for a dialect today. And I, I keep this page in here. People think it's a little bit funny. Um, on the words that are coming into the language from the Oxford English Dictionary. And those words are fine and everything, but they're not the words you're going to use in your history classes, in your business classes, and other things. You're going to be using the language um, of Latin and Greek, the language that was begun in the Renaissance. That's your sophisticated vocabulary. The language you're using with your friends is going to be more contemporary, and that's perfectly fine. That's the way it works. That's the history of English and why it's such a mess. And as we go through this, it'll start to make sense. So don't expect it to make sense because the French screwed it up already. It isn't going back. On this exercise, just take your best guess with these. Okay. So hancha, by the way, I'll tell you this, it's actually a Japanese word. It came in after World War II. Um, and it came in when a lot of GIs were in Japan. Um, it looks Spanish. It's actually not. But English could take that word, no problem, from Japanese because of the French back in 1066. There's no way to block it. <clears throat> other languages have a way to block it. Okay. Um, but anyway, and you can see with some of the other words, like pandemonium is a word that Milton made, and it pan means across, demons, so, and it's a place, so he put a U-M on the end. He created that word out of Latin parts. So, um, the other basic words like dog, mom, and all those kind of words, those are German. Okay, one is German. Royalty, it refers to government, so it's actually French. Hit, it's a basic word, so it's German. Take your best guesses, and they're good enough. Okay, so now going through dialects, this is an important point, um, and I'll probably end this lecture on this issue and um, before I go on. Dialects are um, ways, they're, they're what I call localized rules and customs that people follow. Now these can be, um, and dialects can be used by any type of group that has some kind of common identity and works with each other. Now these can be, we, we often know these by region. For example, if you know the United States, um, most of you are probably Californians. Um, many Californians aren't aware that they do speak a California dialect. In other words, if you go to New York, you might think people speak funny, but they think you speak funny. And you do, according to them. Okay. Or if somebody comes from London and comes over to Florida, the people in Florida are going to think that person speaks funny. Okay. Does the person from London really speak funny? I, I don't know. Or if somebody goes from uh, Sydney, Australia, and travels all the way over to Trinidad, which is a small island off of Venezuela where they do speak English, um, that person from Sydney will be seen by the people of Trinidad as speaking funny. Um, these are all localized rules and customs, and they can follow um, regions, which is the one that most folks know about, but they can also follow ethnic identities and even uh, um, other identities. Ethnic identities um, you can, for example, down in Los Angeles, if you move, if you go from, say, South Central, which is primarily African American, and you go over to East LA, which is primarily primarily uh, Mexican American, you will see that there is a dialect shift. Neither of those dialects are incorrect English. They actually follow localized rules that are built around ethnic identities. Um, the dialect that's used in the South Central primarily, not entirely, but primarily is called Black English. It's the same dialect that's used up in Oakland, California. It's the same dialect that's used in Chicago or in Atlanta or in Harlem in New York, where you have large urban African-American populations. You will have many people using what's called Black English. That's a dialect. It follows rules. Many people misunderstand it and think it's incorrect English. It's not. The same thing happens in East LA with the Mexican-American dialect that's um, known in East LA. It's distinct and it follows certain rules and mixes certain Spanish words in and has certain phrasings that work within uh, Mexican-American English from East LA. That's perfectly fine. Those are localized rules and those are what dialects are. Okay, You can also have the southern dialects in certain regions and things like that. Um, dialects can go across and be um, across regions, 
across identities and other things. And it's very important to know these that these do exist. And we go to um, Oftentimes, uh, li linguists do often study these, and dialects, again, are rule-based. They're not slang. Slang comes in and goes out, okay? It comes in and goes out. Nobody says groovy anymore. That's just slang. Um, that went out probably in 1973. Um, that's not what dialects are. Black English has been around for more than a century. Um, so dialects stick, and they stay a long time. I have this little explanation of it. When Malcolm X was explaining right here, about his shift um, from black English, and he doesn't identify it as black English. He was first described by a linguist by the name of Leboff back in the 60s. But he was talking about shifting from black English over to standard English, standard written English, and the need to do it. And it's called shifting. It's called dialect shifting, when you move from one dialect to the other. And that's what people are often learning when they're learning standard written English because it's very important to keep in mind that standard written English is a dialect. It's a dialect used by educated people throughout the world to communicate in academic and in professional settings. It is primarily a written dialect, okay? There are, most dialects are spoken, so most are. And like when we think about um, regional dialects or ethnic dialects, we're talking about spoken dialects. But many of you obviously know how to do um, text messaging. That's actually a dialect, and there's a very interesting video on it um, by a linguist called uh, McWhorter, and he's watching this and he's linguistically analyzing this dialect as it's developing. You use lots of compression, you know, punctuation isn't that important, um, lower and uppercase aren't used, but there are certain rules that it follows. LOL means something in text messaging. It doesn't mean anything in speech. That's a written dialect. And it has certain rules that people use in that speech or in that uh, written uh, setting. Standard written English um, has characteristics. And the first one is that you're educated. If you're an educated person, you know how to use standard written English. And the second thing is it's used by academics and professionals. When you are in an environment where you are communicating with other educated professionals, such as college, or on your job if you're working in a law office or in a real estate office, or you're trying to communicate with somebody from another country, and you're doing it in writing, the dialect that is used is standard written English. That's what it is. It's the dialect that works, and if you read a, a British newspaper in England, in London, it's going to use the same exact dialect that they use in the New York Times, or in the Chicago Sun, or a newspaper in Sydney, or in any of the papers in Trinidad. All of these locations for English use standard written English as the dialect for communicating in um, the language, in English. That's the dialect that works across borders, across ethnicities, and across locations. It works everywhere, and it's more precise and more detailed. It has certain characteristics that work within standard written English that don't work other, other places. This is a little dialect map. Um, again, I, I encourage you, if you haven't been out of California, Get to another region, you'll find out what it means to be a Californian when they keep asking you what part of California you're from. Okay, so that's what I'm going to stop with for now. Um, and that's standard English to understand. These are some of the recently were added words, these are all you know contemporary English that you use. These are not the words you'd use in a standard in English context, these are words you'd use in text messaging on speech. Okay, nothing wrong with them. So, you know, intexticated, distracted because of the texting. These are new words. So and there, there's nothing wrong with them. You just wouldn't use them in an anthropology essay. So, okay, so that's where you are. That goes through most of the stuff I want you to understand before we get into this, okay? I'll be posting another lecture soon. Take care.